From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! As Daniel Ellsberg, the famous Pentagon Papers whistleblower, has said, it is not possible for a national security whistleblower now in the United States to have a fair trial. In the second part of our Democracy Now! TV radio broadcast exclusive, we go inside the Ecuadorian embassy in London to interview WikiLeaks founder and publisher Julian Assange. He's just entered his third year inside the embassy, where his political asylum as he faces investigations in both Sweden and the United States. What is he wanted for here in the U.S.? Among other things, Assange says... The release of Cablegate and more than 251,000... U.S. Uh, diplomatic cables from all around the world uh, from 1966 to 2010. And that is the largest compendium of diplomacy that has ever been released. Julian Assange also responds to former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's recent comments that NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden should return to the United States to face a trial. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The Palestinian death toll has surged as Israel intensifies its bombing campaign of the Gaza Strip. Palestinians say at least 27 people have been killed and over 150 wounded since Israel launched major strikes Sunday. At least 18 civilians, including about seven children, have died over the past day. Israel's carried out nearly 300 strikes Tuesday, with more overnight, sending thousands of Palestinians into the streets to avoid attacks on their buildings. One strike killed a leader of the group Islamic Jihad, along with two children and two women who were in his home. Israel says it's responding to the latest round of Palestinian rocket fire that began after the mass Israeli raids that followed the kidnapping of three Israeli teens last month. Palestinian militants in Gaza have fired over 100 rockets in a 24-hour span, targeting several towns, including Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Israel says its missile defense system intercepted rockets heading for Tel Aviv, where a state of emergency was declared. Thousands of Israelis have fled to shelters in southern towns near Gaza, two Israelis have been reported injured from the rockets so far. The Israeli cabinet has approved the option of calling up nearly 40,000 army reservists for a potential ground invasion of Gaza. Defense Minister Moshe Ya'alon said Israel is preparing for a lengthy battle. We are now in a situation in which Hamas deteriorated the security situation in, around the Gaza Strip by provoking and launching rockets against Israeli civilians. So, by one way or another, we are going to stop Hamas, whether by charging them a heavy price or by uh, launching any kind of uh, offensive measures by air, by ground or whatever, in order to stop them. Palestinians have argued Israel sparked the escalation with last month's raids and other deadly attacks on the occupied territories throughout the year. According to the website Electronic Antifada, Israel had killed 31 Palestinians before the latest violent flare-up in Gaza, bringing the year's overall toll to about 60. On Tuesday, Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas made an appeal for international protection of the Palestinian people. What is happening in the Gaza Strip, the West Bank and East Jerusalem is not a war between two armies. The Palestinian people are an unarmed people, people who live under occupation. It's time now for the international community, and especially the Quartet and the Security Council, to take their responsibility to guarantee the international protection of our people. As the Palestinian Authority pleaded for international protection, the Obama administration expressed support for Israel's military operation in Gaza. White House Press Secretary Josh Erna spoke to reporters Tuesday. Let me start by saying that we strongly condemn the continuing rocket fire into Israel and the deliberate targeting of civilians by terrorist organizations in Gaza. No country can accept rocket fire aimed at civilians, and we support Israel's right to defend itself against these vicious attacks. 
Today is the 10th anniversary of the International Court of Justice advisory ruling that said Israel's separation wall and settlements in the occupied West Bank are illegal. You can go to our website, democracynow.org, for our coverage of the crisis in Israel and the occupied territories from Tuesday's broadcast. President Obama has asked Congress for $3.7 billion to address the migrant crisis on the Mexico border. More than 52,000 unaccompanied children fleeing violence and poverty in Central America have been seized since October. Obama wants the increased funding to pay for detention centers, aerial surveillance, immigration judges and border agents. The close to $4 billion figure is nearly twice what had been expected. The Obama administration says half the money would go toward improving children's care in U.S. custody. At the White House, Press Secretary Josh Earnest said most children will ultimately face deportation. By addressing that backlog, we can uh, ensure that those individuals uh, have prompt access to the, due, to the due process to which they're entitled. Uh, it also means that as those cases are resolved, and uh, as we expect in the majority of those cases, um, there will not be a basis for those individuals to remain in the country and be granted humanitarian relief, that we uh, expect that the uh, Homeland Security Secretary will be able to exercise some additional discretion that would allow him to repatriate those individuals efficiently. As the White House vows to speed the deportation of migrant children, United Nations officials are calling for most there. of them to be accepted into the U.S. as refugees. A report by the U.N. High Commissioner for Refugees in March found 58 percent of unaccompanied children detained by the U.S. could be entitled to refugee protections under international law. The U.N. renewed the call ahead of a meeting Thursday between the U.S., Mexico and Central American countries in Nicaragua. The agenda includes updating a 30-year-old declaration on state obligations to aid refugees. The UNCHR says, quote, the U.S. and Mexico should recognize this is a refugee situation, which implies that children should not be automatically sent to their home countries, but rather receive international protection. President Obama is in Texas today meeting with Republicans and Governor Rick Perry on the border crisis. In Indonesia, Jakarta Governor Joko Widodo is claiming victory over rival presidential candidate, former Army General Prabowo Subianto. Polls show Widodo, known as Jokowi, has a several-point lead, but official results won't be known until after July 20th. The American journalist Alan Nairn reported this week Indonesian forces tied to Prabowo have waged a campaign to rig the election in his favor, including ballot tampering, street violence and threats against rivals. Prabowo, trained by the United United States has been accused of mass killings when he headed the Indonesian Special Forces in the 90s. He was dismissed from the army in 1998 following accusations of complicity in the abduction and torture of activists. Nairn's reporting on Prabowo became a major issue in the presidential campaign. Prabowo has filed criminal charges against him, including inciting hatred against the Indonesian military. Indonesia's presidential vote will mark its first ever transfer of power from one elected leader to another. And newly disclosed leaks from Edward Snowden have identified five innocent Americans who were spied on by the NSA. The news website The Intercept reports all five are Muslim Americans. Nahad Awad, executive director of the Council on American Islamic Relations, or CARE, the nation's largest Muslim civil rights group. Faisal Gill, a longtime Republican Party operative. Two professors, Hushang Amar Ahmadi of Rutgers University and Aga Saeed, formerly of California State University, as well as a prominent attorney, Asim Ghafoor, who has represented clients in terror-related cases. The five were among thousands of names in a database listing email accounts monitored between 2002 and 2008. None of the five have been charged with any crime. All appear to have been targeted for their Muslim backgrounds and ties to various Muslim causes or individual cases involving Muslims. In a video statement, Hadawad of CARE expressed outrage at being spied on by his government. I was not aware that I was under surveillance uh, except uh, recently, and I'm, I'm outraged that, uh, as an American citizen, my government, after decades uh, of uh, civil rights uh, struggle, uh, still uh, the government spies on uh, political activists, uh, civil rights activists and leaders. Um, it, it, is, it is outrageous, and I'm, I'm really angry. Uh, that despite all the work that we have been doing in our communities uh, to serve the nation, to serve our communities, 
we are treated uh, with suspicion. Tune in to Democracy Now! Thursday, when we'll speak with the lead reporter on the story, Glenn Greenwald of The Intercept. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now! As we turn to the second part of our Democracy Now! TV radio broadcast exclusive, we went inside the Ecuadorian embassy in London last weekend to interview WikiLeaks founder and publisher Julian Assange. He's just entered his third year inside the embassy, where he has political asylum. Assange faces investigations in both Sweden in the United States, here in the U.S., a secret grand jury is investigating WikiLeaks for its role in publishing a trove of leaked documents about the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, as well as State Department cables. In Sweden, he's wanted for questioning on allegations of sexual misconduct, though no charges have been filed. Let's go to that interview. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, where Julian Assange has actually lived for more than two years. He has political asylum in Ecuador, but can't make it there, because he is concerned if he steps outside to get on a plane to Ecuador, the uh, British government will arrest him and extradite him to Sweden. And he's concerned in Sweden he would be extradited to the United States uh, to face charges around his organization, WikiLeaks, which he publishes. So, Julian, I'd like you to respond to Hillary Clinton, the former Secretary of State, could be running for president. Uh, her comments on Edward Snowden, she was interviewed by The Guardian, which first released the uh, revelations based on the documents of Edward Snowden. Um, and if you could just uh, hit the first comment. Well, I would say, uh, first of all, that um, Edward Snowden broke our laws, and that cannot be ignored or brushed aside. Julian Assange, that first point of Hillary Clinton's. It's always interesting when someone proclaims to be a master of what is within the law and what is not within the law. Uh, we've seen a lot with uh, Pentagon generals and other State Department figures, including Hillary. We've seen in this case with General, General Alexander uh, talking about what is the law and what is not the law. The former uh, head of the NSA. Yes. But actually, in the end, in the United States, it's the Supreme Court that determines what the law is and what the law isn't. And part of this uh, decision part of what goes into the Supreme Court is the US Constitution and its First Amendment uh, obligations. So whether uh, the Espionage Act is constitutional is a very interesting question and has not been properly tested before. In fact, the US government has been quite careful to not go to a proper appeal in relation to a conviction on the Espionage Act in order to keep the threat there and not find that it is unconstitutionally brought. So there, I think there is actually a question even as to whether Edward Snowden, through his activities, broke the law, but then you can even go, okay, well, if he did, was it in fact the correct thing to do? Maybe the law's out of date, maybe the law's wrong. Let's go to Hillary Clinton's next point. Uh, secondly, I believe that if his primary concern was uh, stirring a debate in our country over the tension between privacy uh, and security. There were other ways of doing it. Uh, instead of stealing an enormous amount of information that had nothing to do with the U.S. or American citizens. As a journalist, I have been working at various times on documenting what the National Security Agency has been doing in its burgeoning mass surveillance practice uh, for more than 20 years. And uh, other journalists, some of them very fine, have also been uh, uh, trying to expose the National Security Agency. And other whistleblowers have come forward. So Thomas Drake, William Binney, both from the National Security Agency, for example. Uh, but what was the problem? While we could point to, uh, based on a sophisticated analysis of what the National Security Agency is doing, so look at this piece here, look at this little bit of congressional testimony, look at, this, uh, look at the subpoena record, look at the technology that they are buying from this company, look at the number of employees, look at the DOD budget as a whole, and you add everything else up, you can work out National Security Agency budget. That's a very complex picture, and that's not a picture that can generate political reform and debate. And what Edward Snowden did was, by bringing out classified documents uh, that were official documents, that were uh, even some of them just last year, uh, he was able to show even to people that didn't understand the complexity uh, of what was actually going on. So it's, we have proof. People did try to start a debate using all sorts of methods, uh, including former National Security Agency whistleblowers and its only primary source documents in volume that are probably capable of starting a debate about a complex issue like mass surveillance. Hillary Clinton again. 
I would say thirdly that um, there are many people in our history who have raised serious questions about government behavior. Uh, they've done it either with or without whistleblower protection, uh, and they have um, stood and faced whatever the reaction was to make their case in public. Julian Assange. Well, Hillary Clinton is alluding to, without mentioning the name, of Daniel Ellsberg, uh, the famous Pentagon Papers whistleblower from the 1970s. Uh, there's a reason she doesn't mention his name, because Daniel Ellsberg has come forward again and again uh, this year and said that, in fact, uh, he couldn't do what he did in the 1970s today. That the situation has changed as far as the courts, the use of the state secrets privilege, uh, how things have been sewn up, holding on national security cases in Alexandria, Virginia, where uh, there's not a, a, a neutral uh, jury pool, um, that he couldn't do that. And the reality is that's the case for all national security whistleblowers who have classified documents. Uh, you can't fight a normal case as we would think about it in the public. Uh, you're swept into a very aggressive system uh, that is set against you from the first instance. Hillary Clinton again. Mr. Snowden took all this material. He fled to Hong Kong. He uh, spent time with the Russians in their consulate. Uh, then he went to Moscow seeking uh, the uh, protection of Vladimir Putin. Uh, which is a, the height of ironies, given the surveillance state that Russia is. If he wishes to return home, uh, knowing that he would be held accountable, but also be able to present a defense, that is his decision to make. Uh, but I know that our intelligence uh, forces are doing what they can to understand exactly what was taken. That's Hillary Clinton, Julian Assange. This is sadly typical of Hillary Clinton. Uh, we have facts about this matter. Not even the National Security Agency accuses him of working with the Russians. In fact, the National Security Agency, formally in its investigation, uh, has said that they don't think that he was working with the Russians, at least not before uh, he left the agency. Um, and Hillary Clinton, however, tries to reshape the chronology uh, in order to smear Edward Snowden with being a Russian spy. The actual chronology is that Edward Snowden went to Hong Kong. He then uh, saw that the situation was very difficult, reached out for us for help, and we were intimately involved from that point on. So I know precisely myself uh, and our staff know what happened. We submitted 20 asylum applications on behalf of Edward Snowden to a range of different countries in Latin America. It was Edward Snowden's intent to go to Latin America, Venezuela, Nicaragua, uh, Ecuador was also looking favourable, and Bolivia uh, offered him asylum. En route to Latin America, the US State Department uh, cancelled his passport, leaving him marooned in Russia, unable to catch his next flight, which had already been booked from the very beginning. His whole path had been booked while he was in Hong Kong. But she does say he went to the Russian embassy in Hong Kong. Hillary says that uh, he went to the Russian consulate in Hong Kong. I don't know about that, but I'm sure that uh, perhaps he was looking for all different kinds of asylum options, and that would have made perfect sense for anyone to do that in such a severe situation. It is not a matter of irony uh, that Edward Snowden was marooned by the US State Department in Russia. Um, asylum is a serious business. Uh, it is something of a concern that the countries in Western Europe, for example, that he asked for asylum, France, Germany, Spain, uh, did not in fact come to the table. They were too scared about their geopolitical relationships. Uh, it's something of a concern that Edward Snowden, as an American citizen, felt that he could not speak freely in the United States. And he is right, as the advice of all our lawyers, uh, that he should not return to the United States. He'd be extremely foolish to do so. Let's go to back to Hillary Clinton, uh, who now goes on to talk about the debate in the United States. The debate about how to better balance uh, security and liberty uh, was already going on before he fled. The president had already given a speech. Members of the mm. Senate were already talking about it. Mm. So I don't give him credit for the debate. I think he may have raised the visibility mm -hmm. of the debate, but the debate had already begun. A lot of people in the civil liberties community in the United States and the privacy community in the rest of the world and specialist national security journalists like myself had been following what the National Security Agency has been doing for a long time. And we have been trying very hard to erect a debate. 
And there, yes, there were small debates uh, that really didn't proceed anywhere. The lawsuits filed by the EFF and ACLU to try and get somewhere uh, went nowhere because they didn't have the evidence. Uh, and what Edward Snowden revealed was documentary evidence, and it was that primary source evidence that has led to this debate. Everyone knows uh, the difference, but can they, most people can't even remember hearing about the National Security Agency uh, prior to last year. Uh, now everyone knows about it, and that is almost entirely as a result uh, of these disclosures. Hillary Clinton makes other critical points. I don't know what he's been charged with. Those are sealed indictments. I okay. have no idea what he's been charged with. Um, I'm not sure he knows what he's been charged with. Uh, but even uh, in any case uh, that I'm aware of as a as a former lawyer, uh, he has the right to mount a defense. And he certainly has the right to mount both a legal defense and a public defense, which, of course, can affect the legal defense. Julian Assange, your response. As Daniel Ellsberg, the famous Pentagon Papers whistleblower, has said, uh, it is not possible for a national security whistleblower now in the United States to have a fair trial. It's not possible to have a fair trial because all the trials are held in Alexandria, Virginia, where the jury pool is comprised of the highest density of military and government employees in all of the United States. It's not possible to have a fair trial because the US government has a precedent of applying state secret privilege to uh, prevent the defense from using material that is classified in their favor. It's not, not possible to have a fair trial because as a defendant in a national security case, you are held under special administrative measures, which makes it very hard to look at any of the material in your, in your case, to meet with your lawyers, to speak to people, etc. Uh, so this is, it's just simply not a fair system. And even if you do eventually win by the time you get up to the Supreme Court, uh, you spend seven years or something in a very serious condition uh, trying to defend yourself instead of what has happened with Edward Snowden. As a result of him having this asylum, we can talk about the issues. We're not talking about whether Snowden is guilty or not. And Edward Snowden himself can tell the world, well, look, this is what actually happened. This is what is going on. Let's go back to what Hillary Clinton has to say. But the other issue that has never been satisfactorily answered to me is if his main concern was what was happening inside the United States, mm. then why did he take so much about what was happening with Russia, with China, with Iran, with Al Qaeda? That's Hillary Clinton in her Guardian interview, this last point that she addresses, Julian well, Assange. It's no surprise to me that Hillary Clinton thinks that human beings that are not formally U.S. citizens don't have any rights. Uh, but not everyone thinks like that. Um, other people in other countries have rights. Now, if we look at the practicalities of Edward Snowden acquiring documents, why he was a contractor for Booz Allen Hamilton, working for the National Security Agency, and prior to that, a contractor for Dell. Um, National Security Agency runs a mass surveillance program, a strategic surveillance program. The same technology, the same protocols are used to surveil people inside the United States, people outside the United States, etc. So if you're trying to collect information to expose mass surveillance, then by its very nature, it, you're going to expose National Security Agency practices uh, for all over the world because it's the same process that occurs uh, whether you're in England or whether, whether you're in Germany or whether you're in the United States. That was Julian Assange responding to The Guardian's interview with Hillary Clinton. It was The Guardian's Phoebe Greenwood who questioned the former Secretary of State. You can see her full interview at TheGuardian.com. Back to my conversation with Julian Assange in a minute. What's next, WikiLeaks? What's next, WikiLeaks? What's next? Don't stop now, we're on the edge of our seats. What's next, WikiLeaks? What's next, WikiLeaks? What's next? Well, don't stop now, we're on the edge of our seats. You have to watch what you say or your words will haunt you. Take extra care when you speak. One of these days you just might find your foot stuck in your cheek With a flabby old chap and Hitler hobnobbing and the head of a snake And Batman and Robin, there's just no place to hide your disgrace You got egg all over your face 
WikiLeaks Samba, Sonic Disobedience here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman as we return to our interview with WikiLeaks.